The lack of border control between South Africa and its neighboring countries has become a major concern for South African citizens who bear the brunt of rampant cross-border crime. The lack of secure borders does not only affect border communities but has an impact countrywide as many crimes that occur in other parts of the country can also be traced back to cross-border smuggling syndicates. However, two border areas specifically are often overlooked when it comes to criminal activity, mainly because these two countries are largely landlocked by South Africa. In this episode of Open Borders, we investigate the lawlessness on the country's borders with Eswatini and Lesotho. The border between South Africa and Eswatini, formerly known as Swaziland, stretches 430 kilometers to the north, west, south and southeast and comes to an end towards the northeast where Eswatini borders Mozambique. Driving along the N2 freeway, it becomes clear that the border between the two countries only exists on paper. In Swaziland, and where we're driving at the moment, is the N2 National Freeway in South Africa. And this is the border. There's, there's, there's nothing separating these two countries. And we see a lot of people crossing the road, coming into South Africa, um, getting picked up by taxis and other motor vehicles, and also people uh, chasing their cattle from Swaziland into South Africa onto private farms to have them graze on this side of the border. Border control in the area close to Pongolo in KwaZulu-Natal is so poor that it is common for residents of Eswatini to send their children to schools in South Africa by simply hopping over the fence on a daily basis. Local residents informed us of a gravel road that doubles up as a highway for those who cross the border illegally. So we went to see for ourselves. Upon our arrival, we encountered a group of migrant laborers heading back towards Eswatini. According to them, they do not want to cross the border illegally, but traveling through the border post adds an extra 26 kilometers to their journey. Ironically, the road that they now use to cross the border passes right by a South African Defense Force base that is tasked with patrolling this border. What is the situation like? How easy is it for people to come across? And how often do you see people crossing? Well, basically, this is the main thoroughfare that goes down here, running north to south. Um, that's obviously on the northern border. There's an army camp just down there. They uh, pretty much allow everybody just to walk through the border, and but the farmers only allow people to come here. Some of these, um, from what I understand, some, some of the, the people who live in, on the Sotini side even send their kids to school in South Africa. How does that work? Well, I'm not sure how it works, but it happens. I mean, they, they come through here literally on a daily basis. And early in the morning, they'll start coming through from about half past six, seven o'clock, and they'll be starting to go home pretty much any time shortly now. You guys have set up roadblocks on there before, and you found some interesting things. What are, what are some of the contraband that you've come across? Yeah, during July last year, during the riots, obviously, with working with the police and the SANDF, we shut down all the roads in and out of Pongola. Um, at one stage we had 700 trucks parked off in Pongola overnight that couldn't get in or out because of the road closures. Um, and we were instructed to search all vehicles coming into Pongola. We found probably around about four to five million rands worth of dukkah in the space of four days coming in. It was packed in cabs of trucks, it was packed in the back of buckies, it was loaded into the back of trucks, it was in boots of cars, it was you name it, that's how they transport it. As the sun sets on the Eswatini border, Locals know that criminal activity is about to pick up. Farmers on the border are at their wit's end due to law enforcement's disinterest in performing their duties. This 
die recht in die Soße gaan grens. Maar voor die kijk uit op die um, Soase grens basis. En wat is van die problemen wat jij beleeft met die Soase grensbeheer? Die mensen kruip op mij op mijn jaar kruip pleiteren in Soase land en ik kom terug en pas twee keer dag en goed dat je ook hier gaan en maar wat doen we staan? Wat, wat is uh, van ons, van die het nou genoem van dag en maas, aan goed wat ook ook gesmokkel word? Moeilijk, maar of, mense, of het zo is weet die mens nou nie, maar dag is met een groot probleem. Hoe gereeld gebeur het dat mens oor weer in die grond kom? Elke dag. Dagelijks? Dagelijks is dat 10, 20, 30 mens wat oor my op my jaar te bijloop. En die reaksie van die politie en die soldaten in die omgeving? Nee, dit help nie, hier is om te contact nie. En hulle is recht hier by my, maar 100 meter, 200 meter van my af, maar wat help hulle? Die grens, ek, ek weet nie, huis, die grens is nutteloos basis van niemand wat, 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 wat geleer die grens, die weermaag is daar, maar hulle doen ook niks. Illegal immigration and smuggling are not the only causes for concern. Crops are also frequently raided during the night. The crime wave that was caused by the lack of border security and the South African government's failure to uphold law and order has forced civilians to become involved in securing their own communities. The civil rights organization AfriForum has 165 neighborhood and farm security structures countrywide, which comprises trained volunteers. Safety structures in border areas often perform security operations in order to help curb cross-border crime. Night vision equipment and unmanned aerial vehicles are also used to track down criminals. Visible patrols play an integral part in keeping criminals at bay, but catching them off guard is what leads to their apprehension. So we return to the same area early the next morning and, as suspected, these cross-border criminals had waited until they thought the coast was clear to continue their activities. So we've deployed multiple patrollers to various parts of this area now to try and flank these suspects from the visual contact that we made. Um, they were carrying the typical bags that they used to smuggle marijuana with, so we suspect that's what they were carrying. Um, but the challenge is that these smugglers know these areas very well. They know these private farms like the back of their hands, even though they're not really supposed to ever set foot here. Many of them grew up in the area and they know exactly how to get away quickly and how to get across the border quickly, which obviously makes it very challenging to catch these guys once they're on the run. We comb the riverbank that these criminals use to navigate in between South Africa and Eswatini, but they know their escape routes well. Although they slipped away, we soon discover why they were in the area.
So this is mind blowing. Some of these smugglers have now come up with the ingenious idea to minimize their risk of getting caught with marijuana while crossing the border. They've now started sticking onto private farms in the South African side and started dacha and marijuana plantations on these private properties, hidden in little alleyways and valleys under trees where they hope the farmers wouldn't find it. And in that way, they don't take any risk of getting caught bringing the marijuana across the border. I mean, it's absolutely insane. Look at this. There's an entire plantation here. They've even cordoned it off with a, a little improvised boma to keep the cattle out and any kind of any animals that might trample it. And it's a very well neatly planted marijuana plantation on a private farm done by people crossing into the country illegally. It's insane. These criminal activities, however, are not limited to illegal marijuana farming. So what we see is in this case specifically is uh, what the owners do in a circle bar with uh, poaching, where an unwitting jag van under is, where the people in come from from the dears from the land af, and then they will us unstick where then the poker lay naar die groene grasse toe en uh, dan krijg je ook dat hulle jou ei ei uitloop so, soos wat die ou by die vieren is in die aande en bezig is om vier te baklui dan sal die ou kry dat hulle op jou skiet weerskoot um, waar jy dan om natuurlijk so die ou word in, in gevaar gestel door dit ook ja Farmers on the border have often erected expensive security fences at their own cost, only to have the wire and fence poles stolen. They have now resigned themselves to relying on rudimentary fences to at least try and keep their livestock from being herded across the border. It's become very clear from visiting this area is that the only place that the border between South Africa and Eswatini actually exists is on a map. We depart from the Eswatini border and head southwest towards the mountain kingdom of Lesotho. The border of Lesotho is a 909 km stretch of rivers and valleys that are entirely surrounded by South Africa. Here we once again encounter a familiar story. The responsibility of patrolling the unmaintained border roads have again fallen on the shoulders of local civilians and farmers who must use their own resources to do the South African government's work. Neither the border road, which is supposed to be used for patrols, or the border fence has been maintained in years. And this is literally the border between South Africa and Lesotho. The ease with which the border can be crossed has led to a dramatic surge in livestock theft. Farmers are forced to maintain parts of the border fence at their own cost. At this stage we don't have any border. The government of South Africa doesn't help us in any ways with the border. Behind me you can see where a commercial farmer at his own expense erected a new border fence. It cost on him about 30,000 rand for a kilometer and he did it on his own cost just so that he can start farming here on the border and his cattle doesn't wander off in Lesotho. At this stage, uh, we don't have a lot of cattle theft. What we have is a sheep. About almost weekly, we have farmers phoning us and complaining about uh, stock theft. Mostly of this is sheep that's crossing the border and the main reason for this fence is for the Lesotho cattle not to uh, come into South Africa. At this stage, the farmers are trying with the, uh, at their own expense, uh, getting someone to fix a road so at least one can travel the road with a 4x4 vehicle. Otherwise, there's not uh, any patrols on this border. So you as farmer, border farmer, have to do it on your own. You don't get any assistance from the SNDNF or the SAPS. One of the farmers we spoke to has lost more than 330 sheep to livestock thieves in the last nine months. 
Now what these thieves do is they simply cross the border into South Africa, herd up the cattle or the sheep and then rush them back through the fences. As you can see the wool is still stuck on the barbed wire. And that is what these farmers have to face on a daily basis. The ease with which South Africa can be entered from the Lesotho side also has widespread consequences in other parts of the country, especially in mining areas. Zama Zamas, the infamous illegal mining gangs from Lesotho, have infiltrated vast areas of Gauteng with their illegal mining operations. It has been reported that these gangs form the largest organized crime syndicates in South Africa. Their activities include murder, sabotage and sexual assault. Although the South African Police Service has executed raids on these operations before, there seems to be no desire to prevent these criminals from entering the country in the first place. We head further north towards Fuchsburg. In this region, livestock smugglers from Lesotho have even set up permanent residence in South Africa on a piece of municipal land. According to our sources, these smugglers remain protected for as long as municipal officials get their share of the revenue. We decided to pay them a visit, but as expected, no one was in the mood to speak to us. There are literally thousands of heads of livestock grazing on this municipal piece of land, but who they rightfully belong to or should belong to is difficult to establish. Okay, so we can see this one has been branded. It's that WT plus sign. There are many, many, many Lesotho citizens with registered brand marks in South Africa. It's possible if you've got you don't have to be a South African citizen to register a brand mark in South Africa. If you've got the right connections with the Department of Agriculture and they say they, they, they help you register a brand mark. So uh, that's also a problem that South African brand marks are being branded onto cattle in Lesotho and then they come across the river and then anyone asks questions, oh no, they are branded with a South African brand mark. Like, like that little calf there. Most of these cattle aren't branded, but you know, the second they steal something from you, they brand it with their brand mark that's registered in South Africa, but it's the owner doesn't live in South Africa. He's up in the mountains in Lesotho, so you can't even go look for him if you need him. The involvement of municipal officials and law enforcement in the smuggling of livestock is a problem that farmers have been dealing with for a long time. That's the major challenge at the moment. The, the farmers, especially the ones around communal areas or especially municipal areas, municipal ground, really have a struggle on their hands because the um, municipal workers or, um, you know, going way up the municipal chain and police officers own most of the cattle that graze on, on those farms, on those lands. So if you find stolen cattle there or if you know, stolen cattle is loaded there, you can never determine who the owner is, um, who, which cattle belongs to who. 
there's, there's no disease control in those areas, um, massive overgrazing, but there's definitely collusion then between the, the municipal agents or the guys who work at the municipality and some of the police officers because they have a definite vested interest. They actually own the cattle on land that they never pay for. So, and they, they also, interestingly, if you drive through those areas, all the, the herd guys that, that look after the cattle and the sheep would probably 99.9% .9 all be from Lesotho and illegal immigrants. So even the, the police officers who own cattle in South Africa use illegal immigrants to actually look after their cattle. So it's a, you know, it's an incredible situation and, and especially the guys farming around that, they have a massive struggle. The corruption is not limited to grazing lands. The use of the border post in the town of Fixburg also seems to be an option merely for those who choose to obey the law. So we've got information that there's a lot of smuggling that's taking place right next to the border post um, inside Fixburg town and apparently a lot of border officials um, are involved with this corruption. So we're trying to see how close we can get and see if we can get anything on camera. Upon our arrival, it quickly becomes obvious that there are two ways of crossing the border. The legal, time-consuming way, or the other option, to simply pay the right person and slip through a gate. So this gentleman just crossed into the country from the city uh, illegitimately. We saw him do it. Um, he's not willing to speak to us. I hope you saw him. It's uh, very easy. It's a free for all. And um, there's no control here. Cross-border criminals have also made a habit of targeting infrastructure, stealing electricity and telephone poles, electric cables and once again fences. He says they're stealing away any time, day and night. Um, if he's not here watching, then they come across from Lesotho and steal the wire. And do they steal it in order to do something with the wire, or is it just simply to make space for them to run cattle and stock? So, he says it's mainly gets stolen. Um, the guys who steal it, roll it up and then go and resell it to to whoever needs wire. Oh, could you please ask him what some of the other challenges they are facing due to this complete lack of border control? Um, you know, he says it's mainly stock theft of the cattle and the sheep. Um, the, the risk of getting them stolen and them stealing them. Um, by say, by about Yeah, I would have said about I'm sure it's about 20. Yeah, yeah, he says it's, it's, they've stolen a lot of his sheep. They, he thinks they're about 20 that they've stolen over the, over the last little while. Um, he hasn't had cattle stolen yet, but... Yeah, he says he crawls everything at night, and then he's... He says even in daylight, unless you've got somebody guarding the sheep during the daytime, 
they'll seal the sheep here from the felt, out of the felt. And before you know it, it the sheep gone. Criminals also go to great lengths to obstruct farm roads in an attempt to slow down pursuing farmers. This gives them more time to cross the border to freedom. Even sabotaged power lines are used for this purpose. It is estimated that more than 500 farmers on the Lesotho border have abandoned their farms due to the overwhelming levels of crime. Farmers on the Kalidon River have been hit the hardest. Kluter Beis is one of the farmers who was forced to abandon a large part of his farm. He simply could not keep up with the level of livestock theft, infrastructure vandalism and arson any longer. I think on this stadium, the only hope, a bit of hope that we have is the river. You can start to make on the river. He gives you a bit of hope that there is a chance that you a bit better for a week or two weeks or two or a month as a lekker like sterk loop that you more with a gerusted heart can can aangaan that you don't have to go around the river and to be sure to make it. I give you a security. So, the river is it, in a matter for us, give us more weapons what, as what we can get, what we must get out of um, police out of Wehrmacht. Livestock farmers from Lesotho have also come up with creative ways to abuse the open border by illegally mating their cows with highly prized bulls on the South African side. And one of the other problems that we've got is, um, you know, biosecurity. We try and enforce biosecurity with our laborers and vehicles and trucks that's dirty and as far as we can. But then the next morning the farm worker will phone you and say, listen, the fence is cut and there was cattle between our cattle again. If you do a bit of investigation, it's a matter of that they bring their cows over and they use your, which they obviously know or presume it's the better genes that you bought on an auction and they just bring their cows over and they mate them with your bulls and we, we do have farmers that getting into a, a battle where they had to bleed their cows for all sorts of diseases and all of a sudden the state comes to you and they put your farm under quarantine and I mean for a farmer like that to run on a zero cash flow because he can't sell any of his cattle. He needs to farm those cattle, look after them until the farm is clean. And up to then there's no income. You can slaughter some of the cows, but they barely give you anything for them because it's under quarantine. Just recently, Smith managed to prevent 130 of his sheep from being herded across the border. Bird patrols and early warning systems are not always enough. Other, it was on this specific farm down to the Lesotho border, it was about four or five years ago, also on the quad bike, on the track. Went on the spur all along the Caledon River and there where they crossed the Caledon River, I got to a, it was a, it was a gruesome, it's, it's a barbaric brutality. A ewe that lied on the, on the bank with the blood still flowing into the Caledon River. The eyes was picked out with either a piece of wire or a sharp object. And I was stunned by it and I asked around, why would they do that? And the ewe was dead there on the bank. And they said, no, it's the easiest way for them, especially in the dark. Was sheep will always follow one another. So they take the first year that they can catch and they prick the eyes out, they tie a rope on the, around the neck and they lead that ewe and it's so easier for the other ewes just to follow that, that one that's walking in the front and on the Caledon River where they 
basically in their comfort zone. They just hit that you on the bank, they left it there for dead. And it was a it was a barbaric it was it's not for the faint hearted, definitely not. Especially if you put all your effort It's a passion. You put everything into it. And you come across that. It's... It's not for the faint art. And the next morning we must just stand up and carry on. Roughly 80 kilometers from the Lesotho border, you will find the Barolongbu Seleka nation from Tabanshu. This community also feels the effects of cross-border crime. Recently we had a land invasion issue in, in my nation and there was actually a combi, a whole combi full of people from Lesotho who stopped one of uh, the residents asking that they heard that the, these people who are allocating or, or were taking land and they, they are there to do that too. So if it can be that easy, um, because uh, if, if the law, if things were, were a bit uh, strict, things would be different. And, and yes, of course, stock theft is a nightmare for all of us. Um, it's, it's very sad because there's, there's a whole operation when you tend to look at how cattle and livestock can easily be taken and sometimes without a trace. We head further north in the direction of Clarence, an area where Afri Forum Neighbourhood Watch members often assist local farmers in tracking down stolen livestock before the thieves manage to cross into Lesotho. On our arrival, we receive information that Neighbourhood Watch members are getting ready to deploy to an isolated farm where livestock were stolen in the early hours of the morning. It is a huge problem. Uh, the lack of border control from, uh, from between Clarence and Friesburg up to Mnonsa uh, creates a space where people can come and collect cattle and, and, and stock and we don't have the ability to follow it through towards Lesotho. Um, so the lack of border control only prevents us from going back into Lesotho uh, whereby they can, they can access all our farms via these mountains. The, the, the terrain that we're facing here is, is, is un we're unable to reach it via vehicle which means they've got the advantage in terms of speed, they know the mountains um, and if it's not patrolled regularly they come in and take it and by the time the farmers react they are, they are several kilometers away and we normally use the stock yet. The farmer has been on the thieves' trail since daybreak, pursuing them on horseback. The Afri Forum team will head to a neck in the mountain range that is often used by livestock thieves to cross over into the Kalidon River Valley. And if daylight allows, the team may be able to cut them off before they cross the border. These criminals are dangerous and often heavily armed. They've also been known to leave scouts with high-power rifles in strategic positions to pick off anyone who might be following them. So we're currently about 2,200 meters above sea level and um, it's not easy terrain to, to negotiate and that's why local safety structures and farmers have to deploy animals like horses to track down these cattle thieves because these guys know the terrain well and uh, they've been known to herd stolen cattle for up to 40 kilometers in a night across these mountains and into the city. The rugged terrain also makes radio communication difficult, 
but we managed to receive information from the team on horseback that the thieves and stolen livestock's tracks seem to be heading in our direction. An unmanned aerial vehicle is deployed to scout the high mountain peaks. Unfortunately, there is no sign of the stolen livestock. With daylight fading and a long hike back to our vehicles, we have no choice but to turn around. South Africa has been described as a crumbling country. And in many aspects, such as its inability to control its borders, the statement rings true. But more and more volunteers are signing up to join civilian safety structures to ensure the safety of their own communities. And although the future of our country will no doubt look a lot different, these volunteers are ensuring that there will indeed be a future. <laughs> <laughs>